swear by Almighty God, the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now please sit down, Mr. Pildes. <coughs> make yourself com comfortable and tell us your full name. David Hamilton Pilditch. Thank you. Now you'll find in the bundle in front of you, I hope under tab 2, your witness statement has been signed and contains a statement of truth. Do you stand by this evidence? Yes. I want to ask you, first of all, to tell us something about yourself. You have been a journalist for 26 years now, is that correct? That's correct. You started at a local paper. You were formally trained by the National Council for the Training of Journalists. You worked for a news, national news agency. Uh, for eight years you were at the Daily Mirror, and then you moved to the Daily Express in 2003, is that correct? That's correct. I think you are still at the Daily Express as a general news reporter, is that right? That's right. In relation to the Madeleine McCann story, <coughs> you tell us that um, you went to Portugal in 2007. Indeed, you were there a total of six times until February 2008, and you were six weeks in the country on your, at your first visit, is that correct? Um... This is paragraph three of your Yeah, statement. that's correct, yes, yeah, six weeks, yeah. Can I ask you, first of all, please, in your own words, to tell us about the uniquely challenging aspects of covering this story. It's paragraph four of your statement. I'm not going to ask you to read it out, but um, to tell us why it was un uniquely challenging. Well, it was obviously a story of great interest, and um, the problem was sort of accessing information from the police because of the secrecy of justice laws which meant that it was illegal for them to discuss any details of the case or the investigation and normally in a story like that you would expect the police to be organizing appeals and um, they'd have a strategy of dealing with the with the media and the press but and it wasn't there in this case. They didn't have a formal strategy because under Portuguese law it was forbidden to speak to the press. Is that correct? That's right. And then you tell us in the final sentence of paragraph four, quite frankly, this was a ludicrous state of affairs which made covering the story near impossible. That's correct. Did you, did you mean that by that, getting to the, the truth of the matter, or did you mean by that, or what did you mean by that? Getting to the truth, yes. I mean, it was as if you'd been transported like well, Doctor Who into some Orwellian nightmare or something, where the truth is impossible to find. Yes. Well, it might be said that the truth is impossible to find, a journalist cannot properly say anything. Well, that's right, because... <clears throat> Certainly in relation to the police um, investigation, in, in a story like this, you'd, be, you'd expect that the primary information would be coming from the police, and in this case, that just wasn't happening. So you are in a, a, an impossible situation, because obviously you, you try to do everything to make sure that you can get to the the bottom of what's happened to Madeleine McCann and mm. the parents were in the end left to do that job that the police would normally do. Did, did you feel under any pressure to produce stories in relation to this case? There was obviously a lot of pressure because there was um, newspapers and TV networks from all over Britain and Europe there and the interest was in the story. And you've obviously got to, you can't sort of not cover the story. It's something that, that, that that's why I'm saying it's ludicrous, because you have to be in a position to, to cover the story. That's in everybody's interest. You make, you're making it sound maybe this is the case that, <coughs> pardon me, you're on the horns of a dilemma. On the one hand, you were under pressure to cover the story. On the other hand, you couldn't cover it because you couldn't get to the truth. Is, is that a fair characterization? That's right, but you want to make sure as a journalist that you're, you've got facts and proper information that you're, you're dealing with. But without the police cooperation, 
it's impossible to do that. Okay. In the same paragraph 6, the lack of official cooperation between the police and the media, in my view, fatally flawed the investigation into Madeleine's disappearance from day one. Yes. Well, why do you say that? Because, because of these lack of appeals, and there was just no... The things that should have been done, the strategies that should have been put in place by the police, were not there, so at the time when it was most important that people were, were alerted to what was going on. <coughs> uh, that, that didn't happen, so... And throughout the whole investigation, I think this lack of information meant that... Um, and, th and there were leaks of information as well, which meant that, as I say, there was no strategy. And it was just confusion all round, where there should have been focus. But isn't that then the story? Well, the story is to find out what's happened to Madeleine no. McCann. Isn't the story the lack of focus and the confusion? And obviously to find Madeleine, but isn't that the position rather than just repeating? Hmm. That, that was the story that we were writing in the early stages. The story about the confusion, about the lack of information. I'm running ahead of Mr... Jay, and I shouldn't. Paragraph 13, please, Mr. Pildred. You, you make it clear that the police could not be an official source of information. So you're, you tell us in paragraph 13, my stories were compiled using numerous sources of information. Can we just list, please, your sources of information? You say, first of all, I interviewed witnesses, many locals connected with businesses, resort workers, holidaymakers, and expats. What information did they give you which bore on the Madeleine McCann story, which uh, was relevant? Well, the police had been round the resort and other areas on their own inquiries, and we were finding out lines of inquiry that the police were pursuing through speaking to local people and they'd been given dis uh, descriptions of potential suspects, things like that. And, and you'd get the whole load of witnesses giving you the same description, then you've got a pretty good idea of what the police are working on. And then you go to the police and they can't tell you if that's right or wrong. So the, the suspects are these people who are suspected of having abducted Madeline, is that right? I think that's right, yes. I mean, the police were putting out a description of a, of a particular man that they... <coughs> I think witnesses had described being near the apartment, a, a potential suspect. OK. And, and what about the locals connected with businesses? Is this, is this the same sort of inquiry you were making? That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, in the early stages, when, when you... We arrived on the story, we did what we do on all stories, which is go around um, speaking to people in the vicinity and trying to find out what they knew. So during, during this phase, is this right, the, you were under the impression that the police focus was on a, an abductor? Well, it certainly was, and... The, I mean, there were various lines of inquiry that emerged, but certainly in the very early early days, um, they were putting out um, various descriptions, and there was also potential sightings that were reported as well. Yes. But this information wasn't coming from the police directly. And you say in paragraph 18 when you're dealing with other sources of information. You previously identified Mr. Clarence Mitchell as being the McCann's official spokesman, which we know about. Paragraph 18. In addition to quoting from Portuguese newspapers and the, and the Dr. McCann's official spokesman, I approached my own sources. 
You could, could you make it clear for us, please, to start with in paragraph 19, who your own sources were? What I'm saying is that <clears throat> we were looking at the Portuguese newspapers every day, and um, that gave you a, a sort of a starting point very often of what... Um, sort of lines you might be pursuing on a particular day. But um, then, as it became apparent that the police weren't going to cooperate directly, I had to try and make contact with them in whichever way I could. And the, the way I did that was by identifying journalists who had from the area and crime um, reporters who'd, who'd got very good police contacts and they were in, in daily contact with, them, with, the, with the most senior officers in the case, as I've said, who were investigating the, the crime. <coughs> so you identify three sources, don't you, who provided you with information, you say. Two were uh, Portuguese journalists who, you say, were in daily contact with the most senior officers investigating... Madeline's disappearance. The third was a translator who worked for the Portuguese police and translated and interpreted in the Portuguese legal system. Yes. Is that, is, is that right? So they were, as it were, your, your sources. You haven't given their names, but we, in terms of who they were, yeah. these are the individuals we're, we're talking about. Well, these were my, my best sources. I mean, during the course of the time I was there, there were there were other people, but these were the ones that um, that I used on a regular basis. So is this right? The, the senior officers in the Portuguese police who, under Portuguese law, were not supposed to brief Portuguese journalists were doing just that, unofficially. And then you were, as it were, picking up on the scraps of their briefings from your contact with those journalists. Is that, is that right? Yes, and if there was, I was able to sort of develop a dialogue with the police through these third-party sources. So sometimes in the Portuguese newspapers they didn't. There was only just one or two lines that weren't developed that may need more developing. So I was able to ask questions to the police, not directly, but through the journalists who were... Uh, talking to them every day. So you put a question to the journalist, the journalist to the police, and the answer came came back. Is that, is that what you're saying, Mr Pildridge? Well, the answer didn't always come back, but... Uh... Turn on the, the results is... It is quite heightened, isn't it? Well, I mean, we certainly knew that this was something that Portuguese police were considering at that time. OK. And then what, what about the, the sentence about eight lines down? Detectives want to focus on the ten issues that are... <coughs> it, is, it is right to say that all the pieces I'm going to refer to believe all of them, have agreed to be defamatory pieces. Yeah. And, and then you went back to what the position was at the early stages with the yeah. missing child and, yeah. and all of that. But the position we're talking about now with mm. the defamatory articles, yeah. they were written between... Not also right that the best you could do was to obtain from your Portuguese journalists their report of what senior officers were apparently telling those Portuguese journalists. Sorry. The best you... There was also potential sightings that were reported as well. Yes. But this information wasn't coming from the police directly. And you say in paragraph 18 you're dealing with other sources of information. You previously identified 
Mr. Clowns Mitchell as being the McCann's official spokesman, which we know about. Paragraph 18. In addition to quoting from Portuguese newspapers and the, and the Dr. McCann's official spokesman, I approached my own sources. You could, could you make it clear for us, please, it's dealt with in paragraph 19, who your own sources were? What I'm saying is that <clears throat> we were looking at the Portuguese newspapers every day, and um, that gave you a, a sort of a starting point very often of what... Um, sort of lines you might be pursuing on a particular day. But um, then, as it became apparent that the police weren't going to cooperate directly, I had to try and make contact with them in whichever way I could. And the, the way I did that was by identifying journalists who had from the area and crime um, reporters who'd, who'd got very good police contacts and they were in, in daily contact with, them, with, the, with the most senior officers in the case, as I've said, who were investigating the, the crime. <coughs> so you identify three sources, don't you, who provided you with information, you say. Two were uh, Portuguese journalists who, you say, were in daily contact with the most senior officers investigating Madeline's disappearance. The third was a translator who worked for the Portuguese police and translated and interpreted in the Portuguese legal system. Yes. Is that, is, is that right? So they were, as it were, your, your sources. You haven't given their names, but we, in terms of who they were... Yeah. These are the individuals we're, we're talking about. Well, these were my, my best sources. I mean, during the course of the time I was there, there were, there were other people, but these were the ones that, um, that I used on a regular basis. So is this right? The, the senior officers in the Portuguese police who, under Portuguese law, were not supposed to brief Portuguese journalists were doing just that unofficially, and then you were as it were, picking up on the scraps of their briefings from your contact with those journalists. Is that, is that right? Yes, and if there was... I was able to sort of develop a dialogue with the police through these third-party sources. So sometimes in the Portuguese newspapers they didn't. There was only just one or two lines that weren't developed that may need more developing, so was able to ask questions to the police, not directly, but through the journalists who were talking to them every day. So you put a question to the journalist, the journalist to the police, and the answer came came back. Is that, is that what you're saying, Mr Pilgrim? Well, the answer didn't always come back, but, uh, um, yeah, that, that, that was the, the process that I, I was working through. And then you say in paragraph... 21, despite the barriers thrown up by the Portuguese criminal justice system, I was, I, I was able to obtain an accurate and truthful insight into ongoing developments within the police investigation at that time. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. But is this truth, in truth, is this not also right, that the best you could do was to obtain from your Portuguese journalists their report of what senior officers were apparently telling those Portuguese journalists. Sorry. The best you could do mm. was to obtain from the two Portuguese journalists who were your, who were your main source yeah. their report yeah. of what they were apparently being told by senior officers within the Portuguese police service. Yes. Yeah. You say in paragraph 21, five lines down, <coughs> maybe I should read the preceding sentence. Indeed, by this time, one of my contacts 
Is this one of the three you'd identified previously, Mr. Yes. Kovic, was informing me of day-to-day -day developments as they were taking place and before they were being written about in Portuguese newspapers. This enabled me to verify the accuracy of the information I was being given. Mm. Can it be fair to say that enabled you to verify some of the accuracy of what you were being given? Yes, I mean, in, it, it satisfied myself that... Um, this wasn't just information that was 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 being given to me um, that wasn't very good information. It, it confirmed that this that my source was 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 dealing, as he said, with the most senior officers in the case. Can I ask you about paragraph twenty two? Although I was confident of the veracity of the reports I was writing, due to the secrecy of justice laws, they were impossible to prove to any satisfactory legal standard at that time. The fact is that every newspaper, TV network or media organisation that reported on details of the investigation into Madeleine McCann's disappearance were in the same boat. Hmm. So you're, you're effectively saying there that given all the problems you've identified, in particular the restrictions imposed by Portuguese law, on one level at least, what you were writing about was impossible to prove to any satisfactory legal standard. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I knew that the, the reports were correct, but I also knew because they, there was no confirmation that um, there were going to be difficulties if if any complaints were made because they just weren't sort of publicly declared statements. Hmm. Now, I appreciate your, your role as journalist is, is not to obtain legal advice, not to edit the story, but the, these difficulties which you are <coughs> frankly referring to here, did they cause you to hesitate at all in writing the stories you did? Yeah, I mean, you feel uncomfortable writing stories where you're, you're being put in a position where you can't do it in the, in the way that you're used to, to, to be certain that what you're saying is, is fair and accurate. And hmm. the only way you, you, I felt that I could get around that would be to just explain the information in terms of this is what, where the, the information is being sourced from. Hmm. So if it was this... this information is coming from the Portuguese police. I don't know if it's 100% correct, but I know that it's coming from the Portuguese police. But your, your discomfiture, was that something you discussed with your news desk? Yeah, I mean, we had dialogues all the time and um, every day, and I explained to them that the problems that we we're having. And as I say, I mean, you couldn't just not write a story, particularly in the early stages of the inquiry where um, what you were doing was basically launching appeals and trying to to just get people to come forward and um, so basically every day when I'd speak to the news desk normally you'd you'd say look this is what we know this is what we um, the police are saying, and that's taken as being fact. But the conversations I was having with the news desk were explaining the information I had with all the caveats that were attached to it. Did, did you tell your news desk that which we see in par paragraph 23 of your statement? Namely... Due to the restrictions of the Portuguese law, anyone who was unhappy about something that had been written or said about them and wished to take legal action would almost certainly have been successful. Was that sentiment shared with your news desk at the time? Well, the, this is what I felt at the ground. I'm not a legal expert, but I felt that just the situation that, as it presented itself, that uh, that was the case. And I'm certain that the, the news desk would have had conversation with lawyers about this mm. and there would have been discussions, ongoing discussions and 
that was the situation that we were in and there was no way around it. But, so I must persist with the question. Sorry, yeah. Yes. Did, did you share your discomfiture with your news desk? Yeah, I mean, I said that if there's, if we're going to have any problems that, you know, we may not be able to defend these things because we just cannot get any confirmation. And that was the difficulty. Mm. And what was the reaction from your news desk, if any? Well, they took my, my comments on board and, uh, as I said, you're in a situation where it's a story of great interest and you've got newspapers and TV from all around the world <coughs> who are there and covering it and you know that your rivals are, are working on similar information and they've got similar issues and it's the sort of process that you know reporters and go through every day when they're explaining what, what information they've got and you know I knew that all I could do was present it in the with sort of explaining the sources that the where the information had come from. You, you told us about three or four minutes ago you couldn't not write the story. Yeah. And, and then you went back to what the position was at the early stages with the yeah. missing child and, yeah. and all of that. But the position we're talking about now with mm. the defamatory articles, yeah. they were written between September 2007 and January 2008. Mm. The McCanns were given our Guido status under Portuguese law, I think, on the 7th of September 2007. Yes. It, it, it might be said, well, you could... Um, not write the story, there was no imperative to write stories which you knew wouldn't stand up to legal scrutiny. Do you see that point? Yes. But the position w that we were in was that <clears throat> this was probably the most significant development that had happened up to that time in the investigation. So what was, Mr Pilditch? Well, when the McCanns were named our Guidos, so it's not something that you could ignore. And it's certainly not something where you could just present a story that was based on um, a comment from the McCann's official spokesperson. Did when you do any work to find out precisely what that meant in Portuguese law? Yes, a lot of work, yeah. I mean, we spoke to, spoke to lawyers in Portugal, and it was explained to me that there are subtle differences between our guidos and suspects. They're not sort of, there's no legal equivalent, but... They're merely entitled to have legal representation and have other advantages, isn't that right? That's what Dr. McCann tells us, I think. I remove the word merely from what I've just said. Well, no, we were given a completely different version of, of by the lawyers in, in Portugal. I was told that, effectively, an arguido is a suspect, and it gives the police an opportunity to put much tougher questions to, than they would do to a witness. I they're, see. they're allowed legal representation. And I think the McCanns themselves were, a, were given some very, very tough questions by the Portuguese police. So proceedings in English terms would be active? Because there are subtle differences and differences. I don't think they were, they were arrested or anything like that. But effectively, that was, the, was what was explained to us by, by the lawyers in Portugal. Yes. I'm not, I'm not sure whether you fully saw the points of that last question, Mr. Bilditch, but Sorry. That it, it brings into play contempt of court issues, doesn't it? I see. It? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, I... Mm. Yeah, I, I don't... can't really... Um, it, the problem it? is, is that um, the McCann's spokespeople were, were briefing the press at this time and explaining that even sort of the extent where sort of things that the Portuguese police were accusing them of. Hmm. We, we, we have a situation here where the McCanns are accorded, if that's the right verb, a Guido status under Portuguese law. Yeah. They are prevented in any event from speaking out. You yeah. say that they're 
this is right, they face a maximum two years sentence of, of imprisonment if, if they do. Yeah. You can't speak directly to the police mm. because that is also prevented under Portuguese law. Yeah. Just concerned with what are the imperatives, if any, which drive the stories which we know you, you come to write? Well, as I'm saying, I mean, this was, was a very big development in the story. And there were newspapers and TV networks um, reporting what was going on. And obviously there'd be discussions on the newspaper from lawyers and, you know, uh, all sort of parties that would be involved. And I think, you know, the actual le legal sort of aspects would be something that the lawyers would be discussing. Mm. You, make, you make it sound as if the story acquires a life of its own and almost defines itself and then, like a large snowball, runs down a snowy incline. Is, is, is that fair or not? I suspect you'll say it isn't, but um, could you help well, us with that? I think if you put it into context of the story, I mean, the story was such a, a huge story, and I suppose you're right, I mean, there is a a sort of a vortex, isn't there, that mm. it's created. But you keep on using the term the story, but what do you mean precisely by that, Mr Pilditch? What the disappearance is the story? of Madeleine McCann. Yes. Mm. But we're, we're, moving, we're moving away from that, aren't we, with the particular pieces you write? Oh. Well, I was just reporting on day-to-day -day developments, and uh, that's what my job was to do. Okay. You say under paragraph 25 that all your stories were checked with more than one source prior to publication. Once Clarence Mitchell was appointed as their spokes spokesman, it was agreed that all stories would be bounced off him rather than the Mac Doctors McCann directly. This was strictly adhered to. In, in relation, though, to the stories which we know were by agreement um, deemed to be defamatory did Mr Mitchell comment on all such stories? Well he commented on every story that uh, and very often you know in quite strident terms just explaining that uh, this was part of a black propaganda campaign and that there was no evidence to to um, back up what the police were saying. Mm. <coughs> then you make it clear on paragraph 25, and this would have to be the case, under Port Portuguese law, on every occasion, Portuguese police refused to comment on grounds that the inquiry was subject to judicial secrecy. So in, in other words, in order to get to the truth or otherwise of the story, which is what you were writing about, yeah. you couldn't because the police were refusing to tell you. Is that fair? They were refusing to tell us on the record. Mm. At the same time, they were, at this time, leaking particularly aggressively. Well, some people within the police were leaking for whatever reason. Is that, is that not right? Well, it was the senior detectives working on the case. Mm. Doing it off the record, is, is that right? Yeah. Did when? you do any work to a tree? Did Mr. Mitchell comment on all such stories? Well, he commented on every story that, uh, and very often, you know, in quite strident terms, just explaining that uh, this was part of a black propaganda campaign and that there was no evidence to, to um, back up what the police were saying. Mm. <coughs> then you make it clear on paragraph 25, and this would have to be the case, under Portuguese law, on every occasion, 
Portuguese police refused to comment on grounds that the inquiry was subject to judicial secrecy. So in, in other words, in order to get to the truth or otherwise of the mm. story, which is what you were writing about, yeah. you couldn't because the police were refusing to tell you. Is that fair? They were refusing to tell us on the record. Mm. At the same time, they were, at this time, leaking particularly aggressively. Well, some people within the police were leaking for whatever reason. Is that, is that not right? Well, it was the senior detectives working on the case. Mm. <coughs> Doing it off the record, is, is that right? Yeah. Just look at, at, at some of the individual pieces, please. These are under tab four, part of exhibit GM2. I'm going to look first of all at page 31647. It is, it is right to say that all the pieces I'm going to refer to believe all of them, have, have agreed to be defamatory pieces and substan very substantial compensation was, was paid. So I'm not, as it were, concerned to reopen that matter which won't and can't be reopened. Hmm. Sorry, I'm not sure so what I'm, I'm looking at. I think I'm immediately looking at the wrong, the wrong yes, page. Yes, because this is not an article written by this witness. My no. Na my note is suspect. Well, just forgive me, please. What's <coughs> the date, Mr. J, of the article, do you know? 29th of November. No, I, my, my notes are just wrong. Um, I, think, I think we're going to do better with 31645 on the 1st of December, 2007. 1st of... Yes, okay, yeah. This is one you, you, we see you co-author. Hmm. Can I be clear, first of all, about one matter? It says at the start, Jerry and Kate, open inverted commas, still the prime suspects, close inverted commas, that's the headline. Hmm. But were you responsible for that headline? No. You say that with, with confidence. I'm, I'm sure in line with... You, usual practice it, it won't be um, in dispute that the editor or sub-editor is, is responsible for that have I, have I got that right? Well it's not the sub-editor, it would be the editor or the night editor, I'm not too sure who writes headlines but it's not the sub-editors they just fit stories into space I think it's important for our purposes today to establish it's not you, okay No is, is that always the case with these, these headlines? It's never the journalist, it's always the, the editor. Well, it's, it's never the journalist. I, I, you know, something that... I think the editor, or the night editor... I mean, it's, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Well, the editor would have a final say about it. Mm. Well, we can see from the fir first line of the text... Kate and Jerry McCann are still regarded as the prime suspects mm. in the disappearance of their daughter, despite inconclusive findings from DNA evidence. Yes. So, that's your wording, isn't it? No. You don't think it is? No, you see, I, I didn't really write this story. This has got Nick Fage's name on it. Normally, if you got somebody who's named first, they're the people who... Um, do most of the writing. I mean, I do remember this one because I just, I just arrived in Portugal that day, and um, I think Nick Fage was being replaced, and there was a, there had been a meeting going on between the British ambassador and senior police officers at um, police headquarters in Faro, and I went straight from the airport to the police headquarters, and. Basically, I provided a bit of colour from the police headquarters. I wrote about sort of official cars coming out of these sort of, you know, colonial-style police buildings and things. That was my role in the story. Because mm. nobody wanted to talk to me, so I was just sort of 
stood outside the police headquarters. Fair enough, but the, 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 the general tenor of this is that the, the line of investigation within the Portuguese police was seeking to establish the truth of a hypothesis that Madeline died as a result of an accident in the flat and the parents then hidden disposed of the body, is that right? Of this particular story? Mm. Well, I can't comment on this particular story. Okay. Let's look at another one which you might be able but, to... But, but your name is at the top of it. Does that, does that should be just ignored? No, no, I've explained why my name's on the top of it. Because I played a role in the story. But that's all I did was stand outside the police headquarters. You didn't read the story before it went out under your name? No, I would have filed my bit of, of copy to either the news desk or to Nick Fage, who was compiling the story. And it would have just been inserted into the story. I mean, very often, reporters write stories and don't get their names, you know, don't get their bylines in the papers because somebody else is, is the main reporter or is pulling it all together. Um, I'm, you know, this, very often there could have been more reporters, or well, there could have been more input into this story, but I don't think there was. I think Nick Fage wrote the story, and I, as I say, arrived at the airport and went straight to the police headquarters in my hire car, so that's all I did, and then informed him of what had happened at the police headquarters, which was just, I was witnessing what took place at this meeting. In terms of the procedure there, Mr... Pilditch, the assumption I, I was making, but you may be incorrect in the light of what you're saying, is that this is emailed back to, to London, is that right? Yes, I mean, I can't remember whether I emailed my part of it to London or if I emailed it to Nick Fage, or, mm. but it would be one or, or the other, I think. But is, isn't it standard practice that if on the face of it, a story is being co-authored that the copy is sent to you. Imagine Mr. Fage is the primary author mm. for comment. Yeah. You approve it or not. And then you having made any contribution you see fit, the text is emailed to London. No. Probably here by Mr. Fage. Is that not what happens? No. no I, I, I wouldn't have seen the... The whole article, as I say, I would have simply passed on the part of the story I was doing to the news desk, or yeah, I, I think that's what would have happened, or the reporter who was compiling the story. Okay, so which which part of this this piece do you say you did write? But to be honest, I'm not even sure if anything went in because. As I say, I went to the police headquarters where yes. this meeting was taking place and I would have written some colour about, you know, what I saw. I saw the police officers and I saw the people that I recognised who I knew who they were, but there was a whole load of, I say, official cars. Basically, I was stood outside the police station and when the meeting was over... I saw the people who were involved, or some of them, mm. leaving the police headquarters, and I'd have just filed some colour about what I saw at the scene. Mm. That's that was my involvement in the story. Well, I think it looks it looks as if, from what you're saying, that in truth, Mr. Mr. Fage was the sole author. Your name shouldn't have been on this at all. No, well, because I'm not sure where, we're not sure where, where we're seeing the colour you you imparted. Well, it looks like someone's knocked it out of the story. Doesn't look like it's made the cut. Okay. The only thing that made the cut was my name. But we do see from the penultimate sentence the McCanns were named as suspects on September the 7th. Are yeah. you sure that's right? Well, I didn't write the story, that's what I'm saying. Okay, well, let, let's look at one which we can be sure that you did write 31643 dated the 3rd of December
Your source here, just cast an eye over it. Your source here is someone within the Portuguese police speaking to a journalist who then speaks to you, is that correct? It looks like it. I mean, that doesn't source any other... doesn't say that there was any other... I mean, I haven't attributed any other source to it, so... The only attribution, but this is, this is not going to help as much, is at the very end. The source added, once interviews have been conducted, the file <laughs> will be part. So whoever the source was, was close to the police investigation, as it were. And we know from the evidence you, you're giving us, so that it's likely to be one of the two journalists, isn't it? In terms of the, the colour there, which you refer to in the context of the, the previous um, mm. piece, which you, you say you didn't have a hand in, mm. the, the, the term fingers of suspicion, mm. wh whose was that? I don't know. I can't say this. No. Well, might, might it have been your, your term, Mr Pilditch? Um... No, I mean, I, I not, don't really know what it means, to be honest. Well, because <laughs> some, some of the language here um, might, by some, be said to be s somewhat loaded. Hmm. Uh, for example, Portuguese detectives could fly to Britain to sit in or make or break interviews. Hmm. You're making it sound as if guilt or innocence might turn on the, the results is it is quite heightened isn't it well I mean we certainly knew that this was something that Portuguese police were considering at that time ok and then what, what about the, the sentence about eight lines down detectives want to focus on the ten issues that have haunted them hmm. that must be your, your terminology mustn't it um, well, they were obviously struggling, weren't they, the detectives? I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Pillage, I'd just like to understand this. In the first sentence it says, ten fingers of suspicion. Mm. Are you saying you didn't write that? I can't recall whether that was my specific wording or not. Well, do you read the articles when they come out in the paper and think about whether they've been changed back in London, or do you not bother? So what I'm saying is that I wrote this story four years ago and I can't remember if, if those were my specific words or not. Mm. And ten issues that have haunted them, Mr J's question, mm. is that your word? Well, I'm saying the same thing. I mean, I can't remember if I used that word. The thing is, is that I file my story and... There are other processes involved after that, so if I'd written this story last week, then I'd know exactly, well, even if I wrote it last week, I wouldn't know exactly what my specific words without referring to the, the original copy that I'd sent. Did, did you not assemble, forgive me for putting it in these terms, these ten issues from what you gleaned from reading Portuguese newspapers and then turned it into a story in your own language. Well, I think it would have been speaking to my source. Mm. I wrote a story, I presented a story, the way I'd written it, and I can't tell you for certain whether this is the story that I wrote, word for word. I doubt that it was, because it normally isn't, but I don't know which words I used and which words... Um, were used in part of the sub-editing process. But your, your source was only telling you that interviews could take place. I mean, I think my question was, in order to work out what the subject matter of the interviews might be, you, you 
looked at Portuguese newspapers and assembled what you thought were the ten key issues which might be put to the McCanns. Is that not a, a fair supposition? Well, this is what my source would have been telling me, yeah. Are you sure about that? Well, I mean, why wouldn't it be? Can I just pick up on one of the points, the ten points? The forensic findings, do you see that? Yeah. Though not conclusive that Madeline's body was in the spare yes. tyre. You're, you're suggesting there, aren't you, that there were findings, presumably this is a reference to DNA evidence, mm. which established, although did not do so conclusively, that Madeline's body was in the spare tile well in the boot. Is that right? Yeah. The D D DNA, DNA, DNA evidence, pardon me, did not go anything like that far, did it? Well, I think at this time it wasn't known how far it had gone. Yeah, well, that's precisely the point. But you're, yeah. you're making it sound as if there were findings when, in fact, the DNA evidence, if you're going to properly characterise it, was, a, was at best inconclusive. Well, I think well, we know that now, but I don't think we knew that at this time. Well, what did you know at the time about the DNA evidence? Um, well, that there was DNA evidence that it was being examined. But you didn't know what the results of the examination were, did you? No. The, McC the McCann's evidence at um, page 45 of the transcript... Pardon me, it's not page 45... page 35 transcript so it's uh, pardon me Mr. Bilditch it's under tab 5 yeah the question which was put at the bottom of page 34 the overall flavour or thrust of this article it's not the article we're looking at now but it, it doesn't matter the point is the same was that there was DNA evidence which linked your daughter with a hard car. What do you say about that? Answer the first thing to say, it's simply untrue. Madeline's DNA was not uncovered from the hard car. That's the first thing. Mm. Well, we know that now, but I don't think we knew that then. Mm. I mean, the police were saying that it had been. Well, the, the police were, were saying that some, what might have been human tissue mm. was found in the car... Yeah. that they had done some tests in Portugal on it, and the results were inconclusive. Well, I think the t tests were carried out in Britain. And they were also inconclusive, weren't they? Well, they, they, they were, yeah. Mm. I'm just, just troubled I'm just by... I'm just explaining what the yeah. police... I'm just troubled by the use of the term findings in relation to, to this... Yeah, suppose uh, eighth or ninth um, finger of suspicion. It, it, mm. I must suggest to you, it, it is, it is wrong and unfair to characterise them as findings at all. Well, whether, finding, whether or not one adds in parenthesis, they're not conclusive. A finding is something that you found, isn't it? I don't know, but they found something, and um, it was something that had been was being analysed. Yes. But the f the f there are two different senses in, in which the, the word finding is being used. The first sense is, well, we found something which we believe to be human tissue. And the second is, well, we've analysed the human tissue and our finding is X. The finding may be it is, it is the DNA of a particular individual. Yes. Now, we, we never got, did we, to that second stage at all. Do you see that? Well, I was explaining what the, the findings were, I mean... Mm. OK, well, I think I've, I've taken that point as far as I reasonably can with you. So I'm going to look at... Um, to all of these, but you... you did write quite a few of these articles. There's another one at 31640. 
This is, is this before or after that? Yeah. Although it's earlier in the bundle, we are working yeah. Back chrono chrono chronologically forwards, I hope, because the previous one was dated the 3rd of December. No, you're right, yeah. And here you are, you are reporting what the police theory was um, at that point, or at least the theory which was being apparently put out by some in the police um, to Portuguese journalists. Hmm. Namely, Madeleine died in an accident, and then the parents covered up the crime and later disposed of their daughter's body. Mm. The you do rightly say in in um, this piece, about eight lines down, that months of painstaking analysis on DNA uncovered in Portugal had so far failed to produce conclusive evidence. Mm. That was the position, and and then there were going to be further tests, I believe, in this country. Yeah. Is that right? I can't recall the the chronology of when the tests were carried out and at what point the mm. investigation had reached at this point. Did you make any personal assessment, in other words, did you ponder in your own mind, mm. about the inherent plausibility or otherwise of the police position as apparently reported? I mean, I just didn't know what was going on, but uh, <coughs> my assessment was that, um, you know, there must be some form of plausibility in, um, you know, what a modern police force is telling you. Mm. In the 21st century, in a European country, you wouldn't think they were just, you know... Well, you were telling us earlier that the... Portuguese police investigation was fatally flawed. Yeah. And that was the view you formed from the outset. That's in your witness statement. Yeah, I'm talking there about the the, the lack of appeals and the, mm. you know, did, the investigation didn't get off the ground. But I don't know what's going on with experts examining forensic evidence and all this sort of thing. That's just a different part of it. And then at 31634, 10th of December, and this is your piece, mm. I mean, the, the thrust of this piece is that Portuguese detectives were apparently fearful of the fact that British mm. police would not properly in interrogate the McCanns, is that right? Yes. Did you think at the time there was any basis for that fear? Yeah, I did, yeah. From your own knowledge of British police and Portuguese police? Did you really think that? Yes. So, I mean, what, what did you think? That the British police would go easy on suspects? No, that the Portuguese police believed that. There, there, there seemed to be lots of... Um, I don't know if it was cultural dif dif differences, but th there seemed to be lots of disagreements going on behind the scenes between various authorities. And the, the officers who were investigating this case, the senior officers, this is what they were saying. They believed that... I think they were concerned. They'd complained that they'd asked for information and were upset because they'd only got one piece of paper or something, background information. There was obviously issues going on behind the scenes between the Portuguese police and other authorities. Mm. OK, well, if there's only one other piece I'm going to ask you about. It's 31629, please, Mr Pilditch. Yeah. 12th of December 2007. Mm. This is the piece about the priest. Do you remember this one? Yes. Your, your source, I think, 
mm. three quarters of the way down the page, is a close friend of the police. Is that right? The priest. Yes. Yes. Are you able, able to give us any further information about, about that? Um, well, this was, a, this was information that was, was passed on to me by people who were, were in contact with the priest. I mean, I was speaking all the time to parishioners and worshippers in, in prior deluge. So you think it might have been one of those individuals who, who passed this on to you, is that right? Yeah. Because this is, um, if I may say so, a rather loaded story, because the suggestion is, have mm. I got this right, that the, the, ple the priest, pardon me, felt under tremendous... Um, emotional strain because some sort of confession had been given to him by Dr. Kate McCann. That's, that's what you're getting at, isn't it? Whatever. Uh, is that part of the story? Yes. Right in the middle of the page. Investigators became convinced yeah. Kate had confessed to him, but the tormented priest mm. insisted he would stand by his vow to take the secrets of the confessional to the grave. Mm. Are you, sure, are you sure about that sentence there, Mr. Pildish? Well, I know that the police um, interviewed the priest and um, nothing came from it. And I think this is what, well, this is what the police were saying. But it might, it might be said that you were, you were drawing a, a bit of an inference here, that you, you knew from what you were told mm. that the priest had been interviewed by the by the police, but it's, it's just the, hmm. the clause that tormented priest insisted he would stand by his vow to take the secrets of the confessional to the grave. I'm just troubled a bit by that, whether that, that's a, a bit of journalistic license on your part. Are you sure about the accuracy of that statement? Well, I think the accuracy is that priests, that's how the confessional works, isn't it? As a matter of, of general proposition, it, it may well be, hmm. but you're, you're going a bit further than that because you're, you're suggesting that not merely would the priest yeah. stand by his religious obligation, hmm. but he, was also, he would also be taking the secrets of the confessional to his grave because he was given a confession by Dr. K. McCann. Isn't that what, what you're getting at? I think the Portuguese police were saying that they'd interviewed Father Pacheco and they hadn't got anything of any use. And mm. The problem is, is that a lot of this stuff was the, the way that the information was leaking out. You know, it was a bit... It was like sort of thinking out loud, really. It was yes. the, these are the sort of conversations that in a police sort of a, you know, mm. force in this country would be the sort of things that officers would be talking about behind the scenes. But, uh, but all you knew is a fact, if your source was to be trusted, and let's assume for the purposes of this exchange that your source could be, is that the police had interviewed the priest. Yes. But everything else was an inference you might have drawn, indeed did draw, in particular the bit about the tormented priest insisting he would stand by his vow to take the secrets of the confessional to the grave. You weren't told that by anyone, were you? Well, I think the police were explaining why they thought they wouldn't get anything from the, from the priest because he was duty not bound not to tell them anything. Mm. Do not get the point that Mr. J is making, that Sorry. the inference in the sentence goes rather beyond that and suggests that the priest had a secret to take to the grave. It says investigators became convinced, I mean... Yes. Sort of mm. Mm. Absolutely. If you, read, if you read the whole lot as one piece, it reinforces precisely that point. Mm. Because here we have a, a very... Well, I've, I've made the point already, Mr. Bilby. I'm not mm. sure that you're fully seeing it, though. No. Okay. 
This is what I'm saying. Is this is what the investigators? They they interviewed the priest and got nothing from him, and I think they probably thought that they were just going through a routine of interviewing a priest. I think they suspected that they wouldn't get anything from him. Mm. So I'm just saying what was going on, what the police were, how they were. As I say, this is like a bit of thinking out loud by the police that was in the public domain and. Um, it's the sort of thing that normally you wouldn't, police officers wouldn't sort of tell you, really. To be, to be fair to you, Mr. Bordridge, can we can we be clear about two or three matters? First of all, you don't, of course, have a lawyer advising you as to what to put or not to put into your copy. No. We, we know that, that it's... It's not standard practice for that to happen. That happens higher up the, the chain, doesn't it? Yes. And, and secondly, it's ultimately the editor's decision, not yours, as to whether to publish any particular story that is put up by you or any other journalist. Is that right? Yeah. And in terms of the chains or lines of communication, the standard line of communication is between you and the news desk and then the news desk and the editor. Is that also right? Yeah. So did, did you have any conversations with the editor at any stage about any of these stories? No. I think you've told us earlier that any misgivings you had about the accuracy of the stories and the difficulties you were having mm. were shared with the news desk. Is that correct? Yeah. Is, is, is that something you think might have happened once or is something that might have happened more than once? Sorry. Your, your discussions with the news desk, yeah. in particular about mm. misgivings in relation to the story and the difficulties you were having in verifying the story. Well, I think every day you would have conversations with the news desk throughout the day and you'd explain the information that you had and where it had come from. As I say, you'd explain the caveats that were attached to it. And my, my final point is that is this a possible explanation for what happened here in relation to to use your term, the story? The McCanns are declared arguidos by the Portuguese authority on the 7th of September 2007. Mm. And the the direction of the story changes and yeah. it, instead of being a standard story about child, child abduction, mm. becomes a rather more sinister story in inverted commas. Mm. And it's that story or version mm. which starts to dictate the direction in which people like you are writing their copy. Is that, is that a fair characterization of what might be happening here? Well, at that particular point in time, I was reporting on the sort of day-to-day -day developments that were going on on the ground, and this is pretty much what was happening. But during this time, there was also, there were contradictory reports. You know, the Portuguese police at different times was were saying contradictory things. One day they're saying that, you know, they're going down one route, and the next day they're heading off in a completely different direction. So not all the reports were of this nature, but at this particular point of time, when the investigation had reached this point, then this was the sort of information that was coming out. Okay. So there is, there is one more question. I hope you don't mind me putting this. I mm. appreciate that it's the editor's decision as to whether this material is published. Yes. But did you have any personal concerns about this material going up to the editor with it, the likelihood that it would be published mm. simply on the, the human basis that we have already a tragic situation mm. parents have have lost their daughter in the sense that the daughter has disappeared yes. absolutely clear yeah. uh, they are in a state of emotional turmoil yeah. and then to add to that natural emotional turmoil what yes. is being written about them yeah how does that factor into this, if at all, from, from your perspective? Not, not from your perspective now, but from your perspective at the time. At the time, I really didn't know what was going on. I knew that the 
police investigation was was headed down this particular path. And as I say, I'd have no idea why the police were heading down this path. And but this is the point that we were at. And this was I didn't know what happened to Madeleine McCann. I still don't know. But, so I'm just saying that at this time, this was what was happening, and I was reporting on the developments that were happening. But I didn't know if the police were were barking up the wrong tree, or if you know, as I say, you'd expect them to have some form of of competency. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure you have answered my question. Can, can you remember what it was? I can repeat it if you don't. <laughs> yes, if you could repeat it, yeah. <coughs> but you've already got a huge amount of emotional turmoil. Yes. A four-year-old child has disappeared. It goes without saying. Yeah. And then people like you, if you don't mind me putting it in those terms, <laughs> are writing stories which yeah. imply that um, the child has not been abducted, yeah. something far more sinister has happened. Right. The propensity of, of that, or those matters being written about would naturally add to the emotional turmoil, which is already immense. It's whether that enters into your thinking at the time at all when you are writing these stories. Well, I think I explained. I mean, there is emotional turmoil, but... I'm reporting on what's happening hey. on the ground on that particular day. I think I understand, Mr. Pilditch. Thank, Thank you very much. I've got a slightly different point, which is this. <coughs> you may not understand the Portuguese law, mm. and that's entirely fair <coughs> enough. Yeah. But you do understand, I'm sure you'd agree, that stories have got to stand up. Yes. And that your paper is at risk of massive damages claims mm. if you write something that's defamatory yeah. uh, that you can't then stand up. Yes. Well, I think I've said that in my statement. I understand. You were getting all sorts of tittle-tattle right. from different people mm in circumstances when you knew the police couldn't officially talk. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah. And as far as you were concerned, they were going off in very different directions. One well, day this, one day something else. That's your assessment of what they'd been doing. But at this point in time, they were very much focusing on this. So be it. But you had the experience of what they have been doing. Mm. Did you ever have any concern that you wouldn't be able to stand up this story. Yeah. And did th that give rise to concern that you shouldn't be writing it as it was written? I think I was writing it in the only way I could write it, because I was explaining where my sources were coming from, and I was explaining that this isn't something that I can prove or confirm. But those sort of decisions would be made further up the chain about the, the, the law. But I was just writing on developments that were going on on the ground at that so time. So you saw your role purely to reduce whatever you heard from whatever source you heard it mm. into a story? It's not tittle-tattle, you see. This was... Isn't it? No, because it was information that was coming from the senior detectives investigating the case. Well, so you were told? Well, I know now that it is, because there's files that have been released, and there's... Yes, but you didn't know at the time. No, but I knew at the time that these were genuine lines of inquiry, and this particular line of inquiry was the only line of inquiry the police were pursuing at that time. I didn't know the but, truth. But the evidence you've got... Mm. that you've now seen, mm. doesn't in fact justify some of this stuff, does it? Because the DNA was not in the condition that yeah. you've described in your article. The police were claiming it was in a... I think the police were telling lies and trying to claim they had more than they actually had. But in 2008, in July, when the police released their official file, this was sometime after this period, 
there's lots of documentation and there's lots of all sorts of statements and the, the whole file that they've been investigating. It's only when that was published that you could see that actually this whole thing was based on a false premise. The police went as hard as they did down this line and they had no reason to do it. They had no evidence to back them up. So all the stuff, for example, about what the, what the priest might have been told, it's all fluff. There's nothing to it. <laughs> it's all things that were happening at the time. But if you, if you look at things now, knowing what we know in the public domain, it's a very different picture. I agree. And that's why I asked you mm. whether you were concerned at the time mm. that you couldn't stand the story up yeah. with the risk that your paper was exposed mm. to massive damages claims, as indeed they were. Well, I was uncomfortable writing stories like this, but I felt it was the only way to write it. Mm. And but the sort of decisions about the risk were taken by lawyers and by executives on the did, did you write a piece, perhaps not for publication, but for your editors, to underline the extreme fragility of this information? They were well aware of that. I mean, this is the only way you could operate in Portugal at that time. I see. And other newspapers were doing it. There was no other way of doing it. All I could do was ex exactly spell out who was saying what. I was saying if it was a police source, this is what the police are saying. Or if it was somebody else, I'd say this is what they're saying. You know, as a journalist, as a reporter, you want to write stories based on fact, then you know it's fact. But because of the secrecy of justice law in Portugal, you had to do it in a different way, in an unsatisfactory way, but the only way you could do it, which was saying, I don't know that this is fact, but this is what people are saying about these different things. Yes, well... I think we've probably done that point. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, yes, you may. Well, I, just, bef just before you do, Mr. Dingerman, I think Mr. Sherborne also wants to, I think you probably would want to ask after Mr. Sherborne. Mr. Sherborne, what's the topic? So the topic is really one of the topics that you raised in the questions you asked, Mr. Pilditch. It's in paragraph 24 of his witness statement, and it refers uh, to his... Um, assessment, if I can put it that way, of the police files. You, you've heard Mr Pilditch say more than once now uh, that the police files have revealed that the articles he was writing were truthful and accurate, and I'd like to pick him up on that comment and take him through one or two of the articles to demonstrate how that's simply incorrect. But I, I, I don't think he's quite saying that. Uh, and I don't think we need to go too much into the facts. As I understand what you're saying, uh, as I understand what the witness said, that uh, he was accurately reporting that which the police were thinking, he wasn't accurately reporting that which the police could actually prove, because that's not what the police were telling him. What he says in his statement, sir, is that under the Portuguese system, the authorities release the official police file, and then he refers to the documents in there, and he says, through the release of those documents and subsequent legal actions in Portugal, it is now a matter of public record that the reports I was writing between September 2007 and January 2008 were truthful and accurate. So mm. that is a fairly sweeping statement, and it is one which very simply can be demonstrated to be untruthful and inaccurate. And I would ask you to be able to do so, and I can do it, as I say, relatively shortly, and then there are one or two supplemental questions I'd like to ask him on behalf of Dr. Um, Kate and Dr. Jerry McCann. On. So may I make a submission to another yes. friend about whether this is appropriate? Yes, well, I'd like to... You may, but um, <coughs> I think, in the light of my understanding of the evidence of this witness, this last, uh, the truthfulness and accuracy is not intended to reflect the facts as revealed by 
the evidence, but as revealed by the police concerns. Yeah. Uh, but you can ask that question and then you'll... I mean, nobody is suggesting, and he certainly isn't suggesting, uh, as I understand the witness, that uh, any of the allegations of... D in relation to DNA or in relation to these other features are established by the facts in the record merely, as I understood it, by what the police believed even though they couldn't prove a single word of it. Mm. So, uh, indeed, I don't think Mr Pilditch could possibly suggest for one minute yes. that they were true. But what he does suggest is that there were um, documents and other material in the police file which support the truth of what he was saying, the police were saying, if I can put it that way. And that is simply incorrect. And I can demonstrate that by three articles, and I can do it very quickly. Right, well, let me hear what Mr Dingman says about that. So the, the whole purpose of your inquiry is inquisitorial. It is at this stage not going into and dissent of adversarial fact-finding matters. There has been no notice from this core participant. Contrast the matter when we wanted to raise questions of his witnesses, we would put them through counsel to the inquiry. And we respectfully submit that you would um, permit uh, th this whole inquiry to be hijacked into fact-finding matters which are not suitable for this stage of, of this process. But, uh, I understand the point, but uh, I've raised concerns, as you heard at the very end yes. of uh, the witness's evidence, uh, the witness has made it clear the limit of his reporting it's probably not going to advance the uh, customs practice and ethics analysis to look at whether the way in which the allegations dribbled out of the Portuguese police were picked up and reported but on the other hand in the same way that I've been content for uh, various core participants to stand up and make a correcting statement simply so that the public domain, so there isn't a, a, a misleading impression given. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate to prevent Mr. Sherborne from doing that, uh, and maybe he can do it by way of statement, because I've got the evidence of the witness on the topic. Uh, but to cut it out entirely runs the risk of leaving a potentially unfair picture. But that, it, whether it goes to customs, practice and ethics, I take your point. Uh, and m my other point is questions to this witness. There have been no notice of, that he, he was going to be asked um, questions on behalf of this core participant. I have no problems, uh, and so it's entirely up, uh, up to you um, whether you permit people to make statements. But in our submission... Uh, uh, there shouldn't be a practice of um, standing up to ask questions simply because um, they want to ask further details when there's been no notice to the relevant witness. Well, uh, I don't know whether this is a topic which Mr Sherborne informed Mr J about. He didn't, uh, according to the information I have. Um, <clears throat> I certainly required all core participants to do that so that we could make a decision, and I think that was the approach that I adopted. 
And so that's only my point on this point. The only reason for objecting is um, if one is trying to prepare fairly witnesses for what, what may happen, and then people deciding to pick up points that they haven't decided or bothered to notify to counsel to the inquiry. All right. Well, um, Mr. Sherborne, that seems a not unfair point. Well, can I deal with that point before I deal with my substantive one? And that's this. You'll appreciate that this witness statement was only provided, I think, to us yesterday afternoon. I'd that's the first I saw of this witness statement. I'd be very surprised, but... Uh... It was provided to the, to, to the inquiry two weeks ago. I, I can't it. it may have been provided to the inquiry two weeks ago. I did not see it till yesterday afternoon. All right. But that perhaps is a, a point of lesser importance. A point of greater importance is that this paragraph 24 was a matter that only was raised by you, sir, in your question to Mr Pilditch, and that's when he relied on it to positively reinforce the fact that what he had published by way of reports of what the police were saying was truthful and accurate, having had sight of the Portuguese <coughs> police file. That yes. is why I, I stand to ask those questions. No, no, no Mr Sherborne, that doesn't work, because, the, as you well know, the statement would be going on the internet in any event, so it's a public document for all to see, and if the point had to be made, the point was going to be made as soon as you read it, even if it was only last night. Well, so th th when a witness seeks to reinforce evidence he's given in response to a question you've asked, it assumes far more importance than it would do in the pages of the witness statement that have been provided. Identify to me your three examples, please. Well, so I can do it by way of a speech. Uh, that obviously no, I don't want you to make a speech. Well, I want you to identify the three examples. The three examples are, firstly, and they're examples that um, I tried to pick on examples that Mr J was going through, which are not the same articles. October the 1st, 2007 which is an article, I don't have the exhibit, so I can't tell you the page. It's entitled, Now Police Say She Fell Down the Steps, The Hunt for Madeline. Mm. It's one that Mr Pilditch co-wrote with Mr Evans, but on this occasion, since his name comes first, I assume he will accept that he was responsible for it. Well, let's just see it. I'm not... I'm concerned with the fact so that... Uh, an impression should be an, in, an incorrect impression should be put right. So, first of October, did you say? Yes, sir. Now, police say <coughs> she fell down the steps. Is the front page headline the hunt for Madeline? Yeah. And the opening words are: Madeline McCann's parents faced new smears yesterday after it was reported their daughter died falling downstairs. It is claimed Portuguese police are a hundred percent certain. Madeline was killed in an accident at her family's holiday apartment and Kate and Jerry covered up the tragedy. Right. And then the theory is Madeline Four wandered out, stumbled down before hitting her head with a ceramic. Right, but what's the tub. point? The point is this. There is nothing in the Portuguese police file to suggest that Madeline had been harmed in any way. Yes. And there was also... But, but, but are you able to say that the police were not putting that out. That is, there is nothing in the police file which suggests that the police had found evidence that Madeline had been harmed in any way. Yes. My question was rather different. Are you able to say <coughs> that the police didn't put that out? What I'm able to say is there is no suggestion the police were putting that out in the police file. All right. And that's why I say this is not about disproving that the articles were true or that the facts suggest were true, because, of course, it's not even stated they are. It's about disproving that there was evidence or that the police were suggesting there was evidence to support these allegations. And there is nothing in the police files to suggest the police were suggesting that. And if one turns then to the 17th of October, and so this is a point that was raised not in relation to this article. This article is Mr Pilditch's article alone, entitled Parents' Car Hid a Corpse. It was under carpet in boot, say police. 
and refers to the DNA evidence. Yeah. And it's right to say that there is nothing in the police files to suggest that Madeline's DNA was found in the car. Indeed, as the police files show, and as Mr Pilditch would know, the McCanns only hired the car after Madeline had disappeared. Yes, but that's the same point about the uh, conclusive stroke, inconclusive DNA, isn't it? Uh, it's a similar point, but as I say, what the police files show is that no DNA of Madeline was ever found in the car, so there's nothing in the police files to support the suggestion that DNA of hers was found, which is what is stated in the article. All right, and the third point? And the third, for example, relates to one that I think that Mr Jay did uh, take Mr Pilditch to, which is the Priest Bans Madeline, the 12th of December article. And it relates to this. I don't know whether you've got that article. Yep. It refers to the investigators becoming convinced that Kate had confessed to the priest. And of course, again, there is nothing in the police file to say that Kate McCann had confessed to the priest. Indeed, the witness statement of the priest makes perfectly plain, and that is in the police file, that no such confession was given. All right, I understand the point. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pilded, I'm going to ask you the question hmm. in this way. You've obviously seen this entire file. I've seen it some time ago. I have seen this. Well, you can consider over the... Um, I won't ask you to do that. Could, could I just say something in relation to this? I d All right. It's not just the police file that, that I'm referring to here. I'm, I'm talking about statements that have been made in courts. In fact, the chief, in, um, the head of the police inquiry, has written a book. And it's, I'm talking about a whole series of different sources of information that are now in the public domain. Oh, well, then... then that weren't in the public domain at that time. It's not just the police file in isolation I'm talking about. Then actually about. your sentence is quite wrong in paragraph 24. Because your sentence in paragraph 24 says, mm. through the release of those documents, that's the police file, yeah. and subsequent legal actions in Portugal, mm. it's now a matter of public record that the reports I'm writing were truthful and accurate. Yeah. So the, the legal actions concerned the book. My learned friend, Mr. Arnold, was seeking to cross examine on a false premise anyway because right. he's ignored the legal actions. I've got the point. I've got the point. But more significantly, uh, it's as I expressed the view. Slightly dependent upon the brief that Mr. Pilditch was fulfilling and the extent to which s decisions thereafter were made which were appropriate. Right. I understand the point. With respect, you, sir, I wasn't no, allowed to cross-examine. No, no, no. If no, I was cross-examined, it would not have been on a false premise. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm not going to dispute... I'm not going to get into the issue between you and Mr Dingermans. I'm not going to uh, go down the root of trying to unpick what one Portuguese police officer said, either in a book or in a legal proceedings or in the record, everybody has agreed that there is absolutely no foundation at all for the uh, allegation that emerged throughout the public hearing, through, throughout the press uh, at this time that Dr. and Dr. McCann were involved in any way in any inappropriate um, <coughs> conduct in relation to the disappearance of, her, of their daughter. Uh, so that doesn't need to be established for me and in the same way that I wasn't going to go into what happened in relation to 
the city slickers column. This is very much a side issue. I understand the point, and I understand the reason why it is very important for your clients to make that position critically clear, and I'm happy to emphasize it, and I'm sure that Mr. Dingermans wouldn't want to say anything to the contrary, and he is nodding, so I put that into the record. Uh, but uh, further than that, I simply don't consider it necessary to go. And if I say, because of my natural sympathy for, the, for Dr. Uh, Dr. McCann, that it's appropriate, then actually I have opened a door which I cannot prevent other people from seeking to examine in different ways, and I haven't sufficient requirement to go into these areas to justify it. So I accept that. It, it's simply this. You need to consider, obviously, in terms of the culture, practices and ethics of the press, whether it was responsible or, as one might say, utterly irresponsible to publish this kind of information. Well, I think you'll find that the question I asked was designed to that very issue. I understand that, but it is the statement you've seen in paragraph 24 of the way in which it's being said these stories were put together that is necessary to be tested, and that's why I asked for it to be tested in the way I did. Right. Thank you very much. We'll resume at five past two. All rise.